Hi, in this video I'm going to look at the first main section of Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach's Versuch über die wahre Art das Klavier zu spielen and that's on fingering and since it's a long chapter there's a lot in it there's 99 paragraphs in it I'm gonna read a few extra paragraphs I'm gonna try and read more than I have in the previous in the introduction so so we I can we can get through it so here it is das erste Hauptstück von der Fingersetzung Die Setzung der Finger ist bei den allermeisten Instrumenten durch die natürliche Beschaffenheit derselben gewissermaßen festgesetzt. Bei den Klaviere aber scheint sie am willkürlichsten zu sein, indem die Lage der Tasten so beschaffen ist, dass sie von jedem Finger niedergedruckt werden können. Da nichtsdestoweniger nur eine Art des Gebrauchs der Finger bei dem Klaviere gut ist und wenige Fälle in Betrachtung der übrigen mehr als eine Applikatur erlauben, da jeder neue Gedanke beinahe eine neue und eigene Fingersetzung erfordert, welche oft durch die bloße Verbindung eines Gedanken mit dem anderen wieder verändert wird, da die Vollkommenheit des Klaviers eine unerschöpfliche Menge von Möglichkeiten vorzüglich darbietet, da endlich der echte Gebrauch der Finger bisher so unbekannt gewesen und nach Art der Geheimnisse nur unter wenigen geblieben ist, so hat es nicht fehlen können, dass die allermeisten auf diesem schlüpfrigen und verführerischen Wege haben irren müssen. Dieser Irrtum ist um so viel beträchtlicher, je weniger man ihn oft hat merken können, indem auf dem Klaviere das meiste auch mit einer falschen Applikatur, ob schon mit entsetzlicher Mühe und ungeschickt, herausgebracht werden kann, anstatt dass bei anderen Instrumenten die geringste falsche Fingersetzung sich mehr in Teils durch die platte Unmöglichkeit, das Vorgeschriebene zu spielen, entdeckt. Man hat daher alles der Schwierigkeit des Instruments und der davor gesetzten Stücke so gleich zugeschrieben und geglaubt, es müsse so und könne nicht anders sein. Da man hieraus erkennen kann, dass der rechte Gebrauch der Finger einen unzertrennlichen Zusammenhang mit der ganzen Spielart hat, so verliert man bei einer unrichtigen Fingersetzung mehr als man durch alle mögliche Kunst und guten Geschmack ersetzen kann. Die ganze Fertigkeit hängt hiervon ab und man kann aus der Erfahrung beweisen, dass ein mittelmäßiger Kopf mit gut gewohnten Fingern allezeit den größten Musikum im Spielen übertreffen wird, wenn dieser Letztere wegen seiner falschen Applikatur gezwungen ist, wieder seine Überzeugung sich hören zu lassen. Aus dem Grunde, dass jeder neue Gedanke beinahe seine eigene Fingersetzung habe, folgt, dass die jetzige Art zu denken, indem sie sich von der in vorigen Zeiten gar besonders unterscheidet, eine neue Applikatur eingeführt habe. Unsere Vorfahren, welche sich überhaupt mehr mit der Harmonie als Melodie abgaben, spielten folglich auch meistenteils vollstimmig. Wir werden aus der Folge ersehen, dass bei dergleichen Gedanken, indem man sie meistenteils nur auf eine Art herausbringen kann und sie nicht sogar viel Veränderungen haben, jedem Finger seine Stelle gleichsam angewiesen ist. Folglich sind sie nicht so verführerisch wie die melodischen Passagen, weil der Gebrauch der Finger bei diesen letztern viel willkürlicher ist als bei jenen. Vor diesem war das Klavier nicht so gut temporiert wie heutzutage. Folglich brauchte man nicht alle 24 Tonarten wie anjetzo und man hatte also auch nicht die Verschiedenheit von Passagen. Überhaupt sehen wir hieraus, 
dass man bei jetzigen Zeiten ganz und gar nicht ohne direkten Finger geschicklich fortkommen kann, da es noch eher vor dem anging. Mein seliger Vater hat mir erzählt, in seiner Jugend große Männer gehört zu haben, welche den Daumen nicht eher gebraucht, als wenn es bei großen Spannungen nötig war. Da er nun einen Zeitpunkt erlebt hatte, in welchem noch und noch eine ganz besondere Veränderung mit dem musikalischen Geschmack vorging, so wurde er dadurch genötigt, einen weit vollkommeneren Gebrauch der Finger sich auszudenken, besonders den Daumen, welcher außer anderen guten Diensten hauptsächlich in den schweren Tonarten ganz unentbehrlich ist, so zu gebrauchen, wie ihn die Natur gleichsam gebraucht wissen will. Hierdurch ist er auf einmal von seiner bisherigen Untätigkeit zu der Stelle des Hauptfingers erhoben worden. Da diese neue Fingersetzung so beschaffen ist, dass man damit alles Mögliche zur bestimmten Zeit leicht herausbringen kann, so lege ich solche hier zum Grunde. Es ist nötig, bevor ich an der Lehre der Applikatur selbst gehe, vorher gewisse Dinge zu erinnern, welche man teils vorher wissen muss, teils von der Wichtigkeit sind, dass ohne sie auch die besten Regeln unkräftig bleiben würden. Ein Klavierist muss mitten vor der Tastatur sitzen, damit er mit gleicher Leichtigkeit sowohl die höchsten als tiefsten Töne anschlagen könne. Hängt der Vorderteil des Armes etwas weniges nach dem Griffbrett herunter, so ist man in der gehörigen Höhe. Man spielt mit gebogenen Fingern und schlaffen Nerven. Je mehr ins Gemein hierinnen gefehlt wird, desto nötiger ist hierauf Akt zu haben. Die Steife ist aller Bewegung hinderlich, besonders dem Vermögen, die Hände geschwind auszudehnen und zusammenzuziehen, welches alle Augenblicke nötig ist. Alle Spannungen, das Auslassen gewisser Finger, das Einsetzen zweier Finger nacheinander auf einen Ton, selbst das unentbehrliche Überschlagen und Untersetzen erfordert diese elastische Kraft. Wer mit ausgestreckten Fingern und steifen Nerven spielt, erfährt außer der natürlich erfolgenden Ungeschicklichkeit noch einen Hauptschaden, nämlich er entfernt die übrigen Finger wegen ihrer Länge zu weit von den Daumen, welcher, doch so nah als möglich, beständig bei der Hand sein muss und benimmt diesem Hauptfinger, wie wir in der Folge sehen werden, alle Möglichkeit, seine Dienste zu tun. Daher kommt es, dass derjenige, welche den Daumen nur selten braucht, mehrenteils steif spielen wird, da hingegen einer durch dessen rechten Fingergebrauch dieses nicht einmal tun kann, wenn er auch wollte. Es wird ihm alles leichter. Man kann dieses im Augenblick einem Spieler ansehen. Versteht er die wahre Applikatur, so wird er, wenn er, anders, sich nicht unnötige Gebärden angewöhnt hat, die schwersten Sachen so spielen, dass man kaum die Bewegung der Hände sieht. Und man wird vornehmlich auch hören, dass es ihm leichter fehlt. Da hingegen ein anderer die leichtesten Sachen oft mit vielem Schnauben und Grimassen ungeschickt genug spielen wird. Wer den Daumen nicht braucht, der lässt ihn hinunter, herunterhängen, damit er ihm nicht in Wege ist. Solcher Gestalt fällt die mäßigste Spannung schon unbequem. Folglich müssen die Finger ausgestreckt und steif werden, um solche herauszubringen. Was kann man auf diese Art voll besonders ausrichten? Der Gebrauch des Daumens gibt der Hand nicht nur einen Finger mehr, sondern zugleich den Schlüssel zur ganzen möglichen Applikatur. Dieser Hauptfinger mag sich noch über dem dadurch verdient, weil er die übrigen Finger in ihrer Geschmeidigkeit erhält, indem sie sich alle Zeit biegen müssen, 
wenn der Daumen sich bald die bei diesem bald jenem Finger eindringt. Was man ohne ihn mit steifen und gestreckten Nerven bespringen musste, das spielt man durch seine Hilfe an jetzt so rund, deutlich, mit ganz natürlichen Spannungen, folglich leichte. Es versteht sich vom Selbst, dass bei Sprungen und Weiterspannungen diese Schlappigkeit der Nerven und das Gebogene der Finger nicht beibehalten werden kann. Selbst das Schnellen erfordert bisweilen auf einen Augenblick eine Steife. Weil dieses aber die seltensten Vorfälle sind und welche die Natur von selbst lehret, so bleibt es in Übrigen bei der im zwölften Paragraph gemeldeten Vorschrift. Man gewöhne, besonders die noch nicht ausgewachsenen Hände der Kinder, dass sie, anstatt des Hin- und Herspringens mit der ganzen Hand, wobei wohl noch oft dazu die Finger auf einen Klumpen zusammengezogen sind, die Hände im nötigen Falle so viel möglich ausdehnen. Hierdurch werden die Tasten leichter und gewisser treffen lernen. Oh, hold on. <lacht> Hierdurch werden sie die Tasten leichter und gewisser treffen lernen und die Hände nicht leichter aus ihrer ordentlichen und über der Tastatur horizontal schwebenden Lage bringen, welche bei Sprungen gerne bald auf diese, bald auf jene Seite sich zu verdrehen pflegen. Man stoße sich nicht daran, wenn manchmal ein besonderer Gedanke den Lehrmeister nötiget, solchen selbst zu probieren um dessen besten Fingersetzung mit aller Gewissheit seinen Schüler zu weisen. Es können zuweilen zweifelhafte Fälle vorkommen, die man auch beim ersten Anblick mit den rechten Fingern spielen wird, ungeacht es Bedenklichkeiten setzen würde, solche Finger einem anderen vorzusagen. Beim Unterweisen hat man selten mehr als ein Instrument, damit der Lehrmeister zugleich mitspielen könne. Wir sehen hieraus erstlich, dass ungeachtet der unendlichen Verschiedenheit der Applikaturen dennoch wenige gute Hauptregeln hinlänglich sind, alle vorkommenden Aufgaben aufzulösen. Zweitens, dass durch eine fleißige Übung der Gebrauch der Finger endlich so mechanisch wird und werden muss, dass man, ohne sich weiter darum zu bekümmern, in den Stand gesetzt wird, mit aller Freiheit an den Ausdruck wichtiger Sachen zu denken. Man muss bei dem Spielen beständig auf die Folge sehen, indem diese oft Ursache ist, dass wir andere als die gewöhnlichen Finger nehmen müssen. Die entgegene Lage der Finger an beiden Händen verbindet mich die Exempel über besondere Vorfälle in zweierlei Bewegung anzuführen um solche beiden Händen aus der Ursache, warum es hingesetzt worden ist, brauchbar zu machen. Dem ungeacht habe ich die Exempel von einiger Erheblichkeit für beide Hände beziffert, damit man zugleich solche mit beiden Händen üben könne. Man kann nicht zu viel Gelegenheit geben, diese schon oben in der Einleitung angepriesene Art von Übung im Einklange anzuwenden. Jeder vorgezeichnete Schlüssel deutet an, für welche Hand die Ziffern gehören. Stehen über und unten den Noten zugleich Ziffern, so gehen alle Zeit, es sei, was für ein Schlüssel vorstehe, die obersten die rechte und die untersten die linke Hand an. Nach diesen in der Natur gegründeten Vorschriften werde ich nun mero zu der Lehrer die Applikatur selbst schreiten. Ich werde sie auch auf die Natur gründen, weil diese Fingerordnung bloß die beste ist, welche nicht mit unnötigem Zwang und Spannungen vergesellschaftet ist. Hm. So, and that was... That was a lot. <laughs> Now, there was... The first thing I want to say is in... In paragraph 14, he mentions das Schnellen. 
and you might see in in translations in the internet it being called fast playing and he talks about that schnellen often in his book and what he means here he's not talking about fast playing he's talking about I, I, I have a few words for the translation, like impulse and like a reflex. It's, it's that what you need when you're playing a fast, short ornament, like a, a mordant, you know, and, and it's just a, a flick of the wrist or the fingers, like a, a sudden impulse to create that f sudden fast movement. That's what he's, that's what he means when he talks about that Schnell and anything that involves that and so so you could understand when he says that that might sometimes require a slight tensing you know yourself that sometimes it might require a slight tensing up to to create that you know flick of the wrist or, or the that sudden impulse to to perform a very fast short ornament which is different like from the translations, um, fast playing, you know, that, that that shouldn't require, that shouldn't involve any tensing or stiffness. So that's that's what he means when he talks about the Schnellen. And I, I don't really have a, a word for that. Uh, impulse, a fast impulse maybe, or a slight, the slight of the hand, or I don't know, but that's what he means. And there was, there was something else I just wanted to say about the translation. Um, I just took down a sentence that you find on a translation um, on the internet. And I just wanted to show it just to show the difference between what you're getting here and what's available. And this is this is a sentence from this is part of a sentence from paragraph 13 where he talks. He said about, you know, those who don't use the tome, they let it hang down. And then he's saying what that position means or what it causes. And. On, on Google or wherever you look, you will the, the, a translation you'll find is they write, with such a shape, even the most moderate tension falls uncomfortably. Consequently, the fingers must, must, must be stretched out and stiffened in order to bring them out. You know, so, so that's what you get. And you can see that it's translated by somebody who doesn't understand what Bach is talking about. And if you were asked, if you were to ask them, what does that sentence mean? They won't be able to tell you. And you can see this is a bit of, you know, the emperor's new clothes in action. That, you know, if you hear that sentence, with such a shape, even the most moderate tension falls uncomfortably. Consequently, the fingers must be stretched out and stiffened in order to bring them out. You know, with all the prestige of, of translating that book and in the name of education and all, you'll go, oh, yes, interesting. Yeah. And gloss over it. But what does it even mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's complete gibberish. The most moderate tension falls uncomfortably. And the fingers must be stretched out and stiffened in order to bring them out. To bring what out? To bring the fingers out of the moderate tension. You stretch out and stiffen the fingers in order to bring them out of the moderate tension. You know? So, so that's what you're getting. Complete gibberish. And, um, and I translated it. For, so when, when you're hanging, when the tome is hanging under down so it doesn't get in the way for such a position are already the most moderate stretches uncomfortable subsequently the fingers have to be outstretched and stiff in order to perform stuff such or in order to bring such out what i mean with such is the moderate stretches 
And so when you have your thumb down, what I can tell you what my translation means or what Bach is talking about, he's saying when you have a moderate stretch, perform a moderate stretch, when the thumb is hanging down, even a moderate stretch becomes uncomfortable. And so you, the, the, the fingers, in order to perform that moderate stretch, they have to be outstretched and stiff to do it. All of a sudden it makes sense and it's, it's, it's normal. The other, the other one is nonsensical. So <laughs> that's, that's what I'm offering here. That's what you're getting with this translation. You're getting, you're getting an actual translation, not where, where the words are falsely translated by whatever comes up first comes up in a dictionary and um, where the, the meaning is completely lost. And then, it, 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 you know, that's part of the reason why this, this book can remain a, a puzzle for people is because you get a sentence like that. With such a shape, even the most moderate tensions falls uncomfortably. Consequently, the fingers must be stretched out and stiffened in order to bring them out. Nobody knows what that means because it doesn't mean anything. It's gibberish. And I probably shouldn't be highlighting that because I should be better than it, but you know, I'm not better than that. So I just wanted to point that out. That's, you know, that's what, that's what this translation, that's the difference between this translation that I'm providing on my channel, as opposed to translations that are available elsewhere on the internet. Now I wanted to say something else about, in reference to that arrogance I was talking about, this natural arrogance that because something is in the past, it's, you know, it's less, less good. And there was, the first instance of that is something that I fell victim to. You know, in this book, Bach is basically telling you how to become a Bach. And I was, I was thinking, you know, how could somebody be so generous as to give away such valuable information? That information that makes him and his family so special. And then I was thinking that, um, you know, maybe in the day they didn't, all that stuff wasn't so important or, or they weren't so aware of that stuff. You know, thinking of how Mozart, if nowadays he would have been a lot richer with royalties and copyright and all that, as opposed to then in the days where there was no copyright laws as such. So people could perform his his compositions without him seeing any money from it. <clears throat> and then thinking it's that's the same then with this, just the sharing of the stuff that Bach shared it because he didn't know any better. <clears throat> and then that caused me to downplay just, just um, how great not, not how great, but how generous he actually was, that he did know. You can, and you can see that, uh, what he says at the start of the book about people knowing, those who know the right, the proper use of the fingers, they, they keep it among themselves, they, they, you know, so only their kind can be good and, and with the way of secrets. So, so that secrecy and not sharing the information was, was just as pre prevalent then as it is nowadays, which makes Bach just in incredibly generous, like he truly is a, an agent of the Lord with, with what he's providing. So that's, that's one example where that arrogance got me. I, I underestimated exactly what he was doing through my arrogance yeah and there's 
another example of that when he's talking about his, the, his predecessors, you know, who, who concerned themselves more with harmony than melody. And they were mostly played fully voiced, meaning they played in terms of chords, like I, I said in that in the in the video where I read the footnote and and just talking about how the figured bass is and and you know and then talking about his father his late father who who heard great men in his youth who didn't use the tom unless you know except for for large stretches. And the arrogance could have you think that, um, you know, these, these people that they heard, they didn't know any better or they weren't that good, you know, as people nowadays or, or Bach, that they weren't as advanced and they were like, you know, monkeys in the zoo, just banging away on their toy instruments. But... They weren't. They were the best. Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach called them great men. When he was telling his son about that experience, he called them great men. And they were playing a type of music. And to, to think that they'd be playing that type of music badly is... Is, is, is totally the wrong way to think about it. They played that music as good as anybody would play that music. If, if they were to play that music nowadays, they'd play that music better than somebody nowadays playing that music. And I say better because for them, that was the only music. It wasn't like a, 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 like a category played out of interest or novelty. That was their music. And they played that music. That was everything for them. That was their lives, that music. And so they were playing that music as good as it can be played. So the way they fingered, the way they left out the tom, there is something to take seriously with that. It's not to be dismissed as just being, oh, they didn't realize at that, uh, they hadn't realized at that stage that they had a tom. Of course they knew they had a tom, and of course they knew it could be used because they used it in large stretches. So they saw an advantage in not using the tom. It wasn't that they were stupid that they didn't use the tom. They saw an advantage in not using the tom because of the type of music they were playing. And so, and Box says it himself when playing, you know, passages or, or uh, those ideas or thoughts that that use the same harmony you know that concentrate the same on harmony rather than melody just like then days that the fingering is as well similarly applied that so 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 their way of fingering was the best way of fingering that particular style of music and Bach didn't use start. I mean, J. S. Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach. He didn't use the tom because it did the, 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 his, you know, the great men from his youth were idiots. He used it because the change in musical taste and this introduction, the the development of the tempering that they could play all twenty four keys equally leading to the variety of passages and the variety of passages goes if you if you play something in G major and you stay in G major the whole time you're playing F sharp and then all the other notes of G major G A B C D and E and that's it they're the only notes you're playing whereas if you're modulating in a passage let's say you modulate in in through you three or four different keys you're playing f sharps you're playing b flats you're playing g sharps a naturals a flats b's 
C sharps, you know, you're, you're playing all sorts of notes and, and you have a, a huge variety of, of shapes and patterns and sequences. So it was a change in the taste that caused Bach to um, rethink the use of the thumb and not, and not the fact, and, and not that his predecessors or the great men from his youth were idiots. So it's important not to fall into that trap. And that goes, that's the same again. I am your one true God, you shall not have false gods before me. You should not think, if you put Bach's use of the tom or the use of the tom that's attributed to Chopin's innovations or the way he, you know, it's, it's said by a lot of people how he evolved fingering and the idea of fingering. And if you place that, if you consider that to be the one true God, you're always, you're, you're, you're a slave to that. You're looking at, you're looking at the subject in, in the, confined to that. Instead of looking, and you're only getting a portion of that, you'll never be as good as Chopin. So you're looking at that bit Chopin thought of, and you're getting a, a portion of that. Whereas if you look at the absolute truth and get a portion of the absolute truth, you're getting more than a portion of the portion. So it's, it's important, that's very important if you want to, for your own evolution and progression and development that you consider that. And the Alan Coughlin fingering system it incorporates that way of fingering of Bach's predecessors with Bach's. It unites them. And I think the, this unification has been lost with the, how, how, how glorified the use of the thumb became. It's like in using the thumb everywhere and on every key, we're somehow more intelligent than our predecessors, but our predecessors did it because they know something and they would be good. And another example of this arrogance is when, when and Bach says, I think, what was it in paragraph 14, maybe. Um, he says, no, in paragraph 12, He's talking about, when he talks about somebody who's using the fingers properly and he describes, he says, you'll hardly see that the, the most difficult passages will seem easy and you'll hardly see the movement of his hands. Well, when he said that, you can, he's, I, I, I can think of three people he's describing. One is his father. And according to like a description I've seen, that is how his father played, where you'd hardly see the movement of his hands. The other person he'd be describing, I imagine, is his, himself. That he'll as well play that way. And the third person he perfectly describes is Horowitz. And if you look at Horowitz, like in the, that Moscow recital, I mean, a, 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 a characteristic or what you can take from watching Horowitz play is that he makes the most difficult things look much easier than they actually are. And in, it's very noticeable in the, Horowitz, in the Moscow recital of Horowitz, how, how little the hands move when he's playing and, and, and how perfectly still he is. And, you know, in terms of performance practice and, and let's say with, with theories about tempos back then, a lot of it, you'll, you'll hear a lot of, it's, it's a, a lot of it is based on the idea that the, the, the virtues of the virtuosos of nowadays didn't exist back then that they just weren't as good because they weren't as advanced and 
developed or evolved as we are now today. So we're superior. So the, the tempos couldn't have been fast back then because they weren't as good. Because we have technology, we have our wisdom, our intelligence that on our side that they had none of. And you can see that, that how is it possible that Bach could perfectly describe Horowitz if there were no virtuosos of Horowitz's caliber back then? It would be impossible because they wouldn't exist. He couldn't, so he, he, was, he couldn't possibly des describe a virtuoso of nowadays if those virtuosos didn't exist then a days. And there's people who who would agree if, if I said that Horowitz was one of the leading, if not the leading virtuosos of the 20th century. You know, the, 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 nobody could, would argue that. So you can see how how that arrogance can lead to the, it's insidious. You don't notice it, but can, it can lead to the most idiotic ideas and an, the most, the stupidest ways of thinking. As soon as you, as that arrogance slips in, you start thinking ridiculous things. So, <laughs> I wanted to say that. Um, yeah, and it's nice, isn't it? When he talks about, I mean, you're really getting, getting a look into history when you hear him talk about his father and him sharing what his father shared with him. It's very nice. You're, you're, you're hearing about Johann Sebastian Bach's experience. And then there's the, when he starts talking about um, curved fingers. And I wanted to say, you know, if you've looked at my, my um, videos, those episode videos about virtuosity finger position, you will see that what I say only half agrees with, con or yeah, agrees with what Bach is saying about curved fingers, that I say the fingers should be curved on the white keys, but straight on the black keys. And I would say there that, you know, you could think you can either believe me or believe Bach, but I would say that ideally you would believe no one, neither of us. Because at the end of the day, the only authority, the only valid authority on the subject is you yourself. And so I would say to, to think about what I say, to think about what Bach says and to try it out, to actually discover for yourself try the stuff, the things that I've shared in my videos about flat fingers and the cause of tension, the cause of unevenness, trying how it works with the flat finger on a black key as opposed to the third finger on the black key or alternating between the two and notice what's going on and to, to exercise that authority. Um, because if you don't, if you don't discover it for yourself. If you don't become the final authority on the subject, you're doing yourself an injustice. When, when, when you're believing somebody else, you know, there's that, that um, saying about the masses are dumb and a lot of people will agree that and, and like the phenomenon that as soon as people are in, in, a, in a crowd, the IQ drops significantly. And my own reasoning for that is that when people are in a crowd, everybody is assuming the other person has done the thinking. 
And, and, and that's just like when you leave the house, when things don't get turned off before you go. The reason is everybody thought the other person did it. Did you turn off the lights? No, I thought you did. That's when, that's when nothing gets done. And so when everybody thinks the other person is doing the thinking, that's when nobody thinks. And so if you're believing me or Bach, you're assuming Bach did the thinking and you're assuming that I did the thinking. Whereas it might be that neither of us did any thinking whatsoever. And you'll find that out yourself as the final authority when you try it for yourself and discover and notice what happens. And th there was something there that I saw. <clears throat> I came across it at some stage that I wrote down a quote by Lord Gautam Buddha. And I don't know if that's the actual Buddha or what, but it was, it kind of, he said what, what I was, what I believe or what I, I think. And this is it. Do not believe in anything simply because you have heard it. Do not believe in anything simply because it is spoken and rumored by many. Do not believe in anything simply because it's found written in your religious books. Do not believe in anything merely on the authority of your teachers and elders. Do not believe in traditions because they have been handed down for many generations. But after observation and analysis, when you find that anything agrees with reason and is conductive to the good and benefit of one and all, then accept it and live up to it. You know, so that's very good advice. And, and that's what I'm saying about y you being the final authority. If you don't exercise that f fact, that, that element of reality, that you're the final authority, you're doing yourself an injustice. And if you choose to believe you're putting false gods before the one true God. So, and that quote from my novel, and that, um, you know, the sketch for a method by Chopin, those two things go together perfectly because it's, it's exactly, that is how you should regard what Chopin says. And it it's, it's, can be, you know, the wisdom can be found in the simplest of things. And you can see from that, that the amount of time that um, Bach dedicates to the secret of technique, which is what he did in those few paragraphs. It's similar to the amount of time Chopin dedicated to it in a sketch for a method. So, he, the, the sketch for a method, it's not a sketch, it's complete. All the information you need is there to, um, because these are all just tips of the iceberg. And if you see the tip and just pass by it and think it's just a tip, you're missing the iceberg underneath. It's like that sentence um, where he talks about sitting at the piano. And you can see in my video about position at the key, at the, at the piano and posture where I have in the thumbnail saying, is your piano stool box compatible? That's all part of the iceberg of what that simple sentence, you know, what's contained behind or beyond that simple sentence. And so that quote that I have at the beginning of my, um, my novel by Kierkegaard, it, it accompanies a sketch for a method perfectly. And that quote, just to say it again, is, now the dread of possibility holds him as its prey until it can deliver him saved into the hands of fate. In no other place does he find repose. He who went through the curriculum of misfortune offered by possibility lost everything, absolutely everything, in a way that no one has lost it in reality. If in this situation he did not behave falsely towards possibility, if he did not attempt to talk around the dread which would save him, 
then he received everything back again, as in reality no one ever did, even if he received everything tenfold, for the pupil of possibility received infinity. I mean, that could be just another way of saying, you know, if you have a false God in the place where the one true God should be, if he's thrown from that position, you're suffering loss. And the, the, the getting rid of the false God can be that curriculum of misfortune. And so the thing to do is observe, observe what's going on. I'll see this in, in videos where people talk about things and, and I can see that they, they don't, they don't s notice what's going on. They, I saw a video where it was about the fourth finger being weak and, and, and the girl doing the video um, left the fourth finger out. She didn't notice the strength of the fourth finger. She, she half noticed. She wasn't noticing everything that was going on. So most people aren't, but the key to discovering the truth is acting properly in the face of possibility. It's noticing more. So when you try what I'm saying in those videos, they, those videos, they might seem like it's just a, a 40, you know, whatever length video it is, but it's not, it's the tip of the iceberg. So when you really try it and discover and notice what's happening, a world is opening up to you. And it's a world where you can reap the benefits of, you know, what Bach talks about. Bach's best pupil was Beethoven. If that's not a reason to, um, you know, follow what he says, I don't know what is. Because Bach is saying what, what it means to be a Bach. And it was in becoming a Bach that Beethoven could be Beethoven. Beethoven couldn't be Beethoven if he hadn't learned how to be a Bach. He, Beethoven is a Bach being Beethoven. <laughs> yeah. And in the course of this chapter, I'll be looking at where my fingering, how it agrees with what Bach is saying. And you'll see in due course that they're not so disparate, the Alan Coughlin fingering system and the, the formula governing the whole system than what Bach, what, how, how Bach approaches or how he understands fingering you'll see there are similarities. And something I'd, I'd like to do, if I could meet Bach, if that be possible, I would like to talk to him about fingering and I'd like to show him my fingering system. And that would be the one thing that I would talk to him about. The rest of the time I'd shut up because I'd want to hear, but rather hear him, the sound of his voice than the sound of my own voice. But that would be something where I would like to discuss and see because the way I see it, and I don't know, you might see it too, when I compare and contrast the Alan Coughlin fingering system with his, uh, what he says about fingering, that there's a lot that overlaps or coincides so yeah, that, that would be something that I'd like to talk to him about. And because I know regardless, he's gonna consider it intelligently and with wisdom and insight. And he won't just dismiss it or he won't, you know, I don't, I can't imagine there'd be a person better than him that I could discuss it with. Not to say that there wouldn't be a person as good him, as good as him that I could discuss it with, 
nowadays, but definitely no, not a person better than him because he has so much insight. He takes so much care, he observes, he notices so much. It's, it's amazing how much he notices um, and how right he is in, in so many things. <clears throat> And there was one last thing where he was saying about how you can not have too much opportunity to practice, to play in unison. And that I would refer you to that video, another characteristic of virtuosity, where on the thumbnail I say hands separately, hands together is a, is a myth. And there I, I talk about in connection with finger position and all about how the, the hands are perfectly coordinated and that that is something to tap into so i would say to try that and and tap into if you if you haven't experienced that then it's something you're not tapping into but it it's something you can do so i would say tr tap into that there is no there is no other option it's there if you're not tapping into it take another look and try it again because if if you're not if you're human you can tap into that and and all practicing in unison before that is is a, a waste of time not only will you never be that great at it you're you're missing out on all the the, 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 the pleasurable experience of being so synchronized and in a natural way that it could be a joy to play hands together in unison scales or anything like that as opposed to a chore or in where it's something you, with which you need discipline and the irony is you, you, you don't even need to practice it when, when you tap into that. Whereas when you're doing it mechanically or by the metronome and, and you're trying to force your mind to play perfectly in unison, to, to control your fingers that they play perfectly in unison, you have to practice ages for it to work. And then when it counts, it doesn't work. And you can see in the, in the revolutionary etude or in the Tempest, in the first movement of the Tempest Sonata, there in the, the development after the triplet sections when when that comes in in bef at the last bit of the development section where it's in quavers and and it's mostly in unison that's when that's when it really comes into play when it actually you get it perfect you get it right and you can put in all the expression all the musicality into it because you can concentrate on the expression and the musicality because you don't have to think about the hands staying together they do that by themselves so please um, check that out and that's <laughs> that's it I, I every time i'm just i'm picking things to to mention and so what would be very welcome I'd welcome and um, what would enhance these videos would be if there's anything in what Box says that you notice perhaps if you don't mind you could just write it in the comments and you now because there's 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 all sorts of things to notice in those words and I, I'm I'm my it's my goal to to um, translate these words and, and communicate them as accurately as possible. Whereas, and, and I, don't, I don't stop with the translation until everything makes sense. And as well in the comments, if there's something that didn't make sense and you'd like me to explain, you could ask in the comments and I'll, you know, I'll, do my best to respond and explain again that'll all enhance 
these videos and the, your experience or watching them and learning from them. So that's it. I'll continue with more of fingering in the next video. Bye.